What's up guys, Matt here, coming to you from Laid Loss Harley-Davidson. So we're gonna be doing a test ride and review on the new Street Bob, the 2021 model year Street Bob. Nick and I are gonna take out a couple bikes and we're gonna put it through its paces. We have the new 114 this year. We have a pretty cool new paint job and passenger seats and foot pegs. So there's a couple of modifications this year to the Street Bob, got a little bit of a makeover. So it's one of the bikes that we wanted to review right out of the gate. So we're gonna take you out. Nick and I are gonna give you our thoughts about it. And hopefully we can talk to you guys about all the things that have been changed this year. And hopefully we can tell you guys exactly who we feel like is the best buyer and the best rider for the new Street Bob. How's it going guys? Uh, we just got back from taking the uh, Street Bob out and uh, it was a lot of fun. I hadn't ridden a 114 Street Bob since probably like a stage three street bob that we had built so it was kind of nice to feel the big motor in a uh, in a really light uh chassis so um it was a lot of fun to take the bike out and uh you know just kind of experience what a stripped down you know bobber with a big motor is like because um, that's really how i kind of see the street bob at, at, at this point it's, it's kind of the stripped down bike where if you know what you want is the big motor and uh other than that, you don't got a lot of needs, then the Street Bob is, is a pretty awesome choice. Um, and I think it was really smart of Harley to kind of move in, in the direction that they did with the Street Bob. It was in, in my position, kind of a, a no man's land area where uh, it just, it didn't really hit what the crowd that was buying the Lowrider S wanted. Uh, it didn't hit it well enough to be a compelling offer. Pretty much everyone went for the Lowrider S, at least where we're at. Um, I'm sure in other parts of the country it's it's slightly different, but but here it's like, you know, you want the blacked out bike, you want the big motor, um, and you're just going to pony up what you got to pony up to get there. Uh, and the problem with the Street Bob was just kind of that, you know, you sacrificed a lot, and it wasn't that much less expensive than the Lowrider S was. So I think it's in a much better spot now. And I think it also is doing kind of double duty taking over for where the Lowrider standard was. Um, you know, I was talking to, uh, to Matt about this, but there's, I think, no bike that is too up capable from the factory uh, until you get to the Street Bob in terms of price point. Um, and if the Street Bob hadn't gone to a passenger setup like it has now, it would, it would be I mean, what the heritage, or uh, I mean, now that the deluxe is gone, it would. I guess the heritage would have been the first bike that you could get on price point wise that would, you know, be too up capable. Unless I'm thinking of, I mean, all the all the soft tails are kind of in that price point, right? But you you wouldn't be able to do it on the standard, not from the factory. None of the Sportsters currently have two up seating, um, and with a low rider gone, really, you know, it was I think important to put the passenger setup on the street bob so that you know there's something in that sub fifteen thousand dollar price point that is going to get you two up capability without having to add pegs and, and a seat. It's not the end of the world on the sporties; it happens all the time. It's not a huge investment, but it's kind of nice to just be able to take a bike that's already you know set up like that from the factory and it's a nice value add uh, enough people add it uh, or would like to have it in a pinch that um, I think it's a nice uh, addition on the bike and it's a way to differentiate it too from uh, you know something like a lowrider s where it's like if you want to do two up on a lowrider s now you're talking about adding another seat and you're talking about adding rear pegs and suddenly now the price points even further away from where the street bob is so um, it was a really good I think decision on the part of the motor company to, to put it on there because um, you know, it, it, it's a big value add for the guy who's looking to do a quick two up ride. So one of the things that I've noticed that Harley Davidson's been doing lately is they've really tried to diversify their models. So every model is very unique and, and stands alone in its own right. And there aren't too many overlapping characteristics with other models. And Harley Davidson has definitely done that with the Street Bob this year. So the Street Bob starting in the 2018 model year received the new soft tail chassis along with all the, the X Dyna models that I like to refer to them as. And so that used to be the lowest priced soft tail within the lineup um, at somewhere around $13,500, dollars And then they introduced the soft tail standard, uh, which came out and it was about $1,000 less than the Street Bob. But it was basically a Street Bob with just the chrome finishes on. And so they were very, very similar. and. There wasn't a whole lot of uh, product differentiation, and so I think that it was kind of a key moment this year and, and a key move that Harley Davidson made. Give it the 114, and really give it an overhaul on the graphics, which the 
kind of the notorious historical racing one that Harley Davidson has applied to the tank is a pretty cool touch. And the other things they applied to it this year is you now have the passenger pillion on there with the passenger pegs, which, you know, you can always add that to the previous generation Street Bob, but getting it right there from the factory is kind of a nice thing. And, you know, it's going to save you, you know, several hundred dollars by having it on there already. I think another problem that the Street Bob had last year was just proximity and similarity to the standard. I thought the soft tail standard was a cool bike, you know, for the guy that really wanted to get a big twin, six speed transmission, and just wanted to get into the soft tail lineup at the lowest price that Harley could offer a bike. And it was great for that. You know, I think there was a lot of value there. But then you looked at the Street Bob relative to that and it was basically you were paying a thousand bucks more to get a blacked out bike, um, which, you know, is not an unreasonable price to ask for that. I mean, if you tried to black out a bike yourself like I have, you find out pretty quickly that it's not a cheap uh, endeavor. So uh, I'm not surprised. But uh, the reality is that it just seemed like the models were too closely related in my mind. You know, they were literally identical bikes other than finish. And there's not really too many bikes in Harley's lineup where you could say that, you know. Uh, this standard um, Street Glide and the standard Road Glide have a bunch of other things that are actually different from the specials in addition to being chrome versus black. Um, and now, of course, you can get the you know, the Street Glide Special in black or chrome, but it's literally the same model. So it was kind of weird to me that the uh, Standard and the Street Bob were two different models when they were pretty much the same bike, just with different uh, treatments in terms of the finishes. So I think it was really smart of Harley to change it up. I like a lot of the smaller changes that they made to the bike. Um, I like the side uh, material on the seat now. It's kind of this uh, woven pattern that looks pretty cool. Um, you know, the, uh, the tank graphics I'm a huge fan of. Uh, I do kind of wish that there was a black option that was maybe a little more subtle than the orange. I'm a huge fan of, of black and orange because, I mean, I work for Harley Davidson, so, uh, like, you kind of have to be. It's mandatory, but luckily I do like orange a lot. Obviously, a lot of you have seen uh, my father's uh, FXR, and so, I mean, orange bikes have just kind of always been in the family, so I love the orange on the tank. Um, but just as a salesman, uh, I just know that a uh, straight black would have probably sold uh, better. Um, but that being said, I'm so enthusiastic about the other colors that the fact that the black is got the orange tank on it doesn't really bug me because the Deadwood green looks amazing, the white looks amazing, and the orange uh, with the black graphics looks amazing. So I don't really think it was a bad color this year on the Street Bob. I'm a big fan of all of them. Um, I just know that, you know, not everybody's like me and a lot of guys like the totally blacked out look, you know, it's like the Iron 1200 and the, well, I shouldn't say the Iron 1200, the Iron 883, for example, like the blacked out black denim Iron 883, it doesn't matter what amazing color Harley puts on the Iron 883, every year the black is the strongest selling uh, bike, uh, so at least at our dealership. Uh, and so I just kind of wish that they had done a solid uh, black option with a minimalist graphic or even the same number one, but maybe in like a dark gray or something, just because, um, you know, like I said, I like selling bikes and I just, I just feel like personally it would have sold a little bit better, but you know, the motor company is not going to hire me for paint anytime soon. So other than that, the, uh, the ergonomics of the bike really haven't changed, uh, which is, I think a good thing. Uh, I think the, the mini apes have a fair amount of adjustability, even as a five foot eight guy. Uh, you know, five foot nine on a good day. You know, they're they're not too high for me. They're right about shoulder length and or shoulder height. And even for I've seen guys get on that are six foot, six foot two. The, the bars are are pretty comfortable. I think for for most guys, uh, it's not usually a problem. Uh, I'd say where the bike does require some ergonomic changes for taller riders would be, you know, just the the pegs. You know, the mid controls are in a little bit closer. If you're a taller guy, you're probably going to appreciate the forward control, something similar to like what the Fat Bob has. Uh, it might also just be a reason to choose something like the Fat Bob. Um, you know, the taller seat height, uh, the forward controls on there, all those things are going to go a long way to making a taller rider a little bit more comfortable. Um, although you do have the lower bars on the Fat Bob, which might force you into a little bit more of a lean. But uh, overall, I'd say the bike ergonomically is going to work for a lot of riders. Uh, it's got a low seat height, so if you're not the tallest guy, you're going to appreciate that. It's got nice bars with a fair amount of adjustment because you can kind of pull them back towards you a little bit. Um, and so that's going to work for a variety of riders in terms of their height. Um, really, the only thing is, you know, if you're over maybe 
you know, six foot, six foot and taller, you're probably going to feel a little bit cramped with the, the peg location and you're probably going to be a great candidate for forward controls on this bike, which luckily Harley has a kit available. So it's not uh, the end of the world. If you decide to do that, it's, you know, uh, you know, there's factory parts for it. First off and foremost, if you're looking for a factory bobber bike, the Street Bob is really probably the best way to go as far as the Harley-Davidson stock bike is the Street Bob. You know, one could also argue too that you could get the same type of styling from a Slim, although the Slim is a little bit more of that historic post-World War II look and a little bit different styling with the wheels and the tire size and everything. Um, and also a lot, for a lot of the guys that want that performance driven Dyna slash soft tail. I know I still use the word Dyna just because the Dyna has built such a culture over the years that a lot of guys just know that, hey, I want a Dyna. Where the Dyna no longer exists, you can still kind of get that same premise as far as handling and weight and styling characteristics out of the new soft tail that you once got from a Dyna. So I, I kind of lump it in there Dyna and modern soft tail is one. So if you're looking for that barber styling, if you're looking for that size, you know, this bike weighs in at about 680 pounds, give or take 10 pounds. And so if you're looking for that size and weight, especially with the, the 114, the power to weight ratio is very, very strong for a cruiser. Um, and so this bike is a great choice there as well. Now, if you're shopping this bike against a, a Sportster, a couple things to take into consideration. Uh, and, and Nick and I did a video a couple months ago comparing the Iron 1200 to a Street Bob and so I'm going to kind of echo a lot of the things I said in that video. These two bikes are significantly different. If you're someone that rides hard, gets out on the freeway, does a lot of high speed riding, the Street Bob is a slam dunk must have bike. The iron is significantly less powerful. You only have a five speed transmission, which makes a huge difference out on the highway when you're doing 65 miles an hour plus. And at 114 in this light chassis, now you're you're right up there with a lowrider s you know so many guys come in here wanting the lowrider s because you got the 114 you have the mid-size frame of the soft tail you don't have the dual disc brakes you don't have the inverted front end that you get on a lowrider s and so those are two things that you definitely want to take into consideration you still have the three and a half gallon tank on here as well so you know the lowrider s coming in at about eighteen thousand dollars you get those three things that I just mentioned, the dual disc brakes, the inverted front end, and the, the larger gas tank, which if you want those things, the price point is definitely good on the Lowrider S. But if those, those are things that maybe you don't care so much about, you're willing to compromise those, grab the Street Bob, you're getting the 114, uh, you're getting the new styling with the, the passenger seat and everything. And so the value is very, very good on this Street Bob. Um, and so I, I feel like it is an even more uh, enticing bike at that price point with that engine on there. Nick and I always talk about how the Lowrider S is kind of king within the soft tail world at the price point with all the equipment that it offers. I feel like now this year we're going to see a lot more people thinking twice about going to the Lowrider S and maybe just picking up the Street Bob instead because they get the 114 and the brakes still being you know very good. A lot of times people criticize bikes that have a larger engine in the 114 that maybe don't have uh, what they feel like is the adequate braking capability of the dual disc brakes. So I think a lot of people might make that argument on this bike. I would just tell you this, the single braking on this bike is definitely adequate. I feel like the guys that are gonna ride canyons a lot that are either on the throttle or on the brakes 100% of the time, you might find yourself benefiting from the dual disc brakes because if you're doing a lot of heavy braking, you know, as you enter every single turn, brakes are gonna get hot. You may get some of that brake fade on the single disc. Although me personally, I don't feel like I've ever experienced it on the new soft tails. However, you do have a little bit, you know, grabbier brake with the dual brakes, dual disc brakes, I feel. So if you're an aggressive rider, and you're doing a lot of heavy braking, then the dual bra disc brakes is a nice thing to have. However, if you're just gonna ride a cruiser like a cruiser, probably don't need them. So, I mean, uh, for those of you who are a little bit unfamiliar with the term bobber uh, or, you know, street bob in this instance, 
really the whole point of a bobber is a minimalist design. Um, you know, that's, I mean, part of the reason that they went to the tank design that they went on the spike is they wanted a three and a half gallon tank that was gonna showcase and highlight the motor. I mean, when you look at this bike, the motor's basically exploding out of the frame. Like it's more motor than bike, um, which is the look that they wanted to go for. And on bobbers that are non-factory bikes, basically bikes that people have customized and turned into bobs, um, you know, gauges are taken off. Pretty much any panel that's not required is taken off. Fenders, everything is stripped down. So Harley went to great lengths to make the design as minimalist as possible. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that are like, how come Harley didn't put this on there and didn't put that on there? It's like, well, it's called a street bob. Like the whole idea is taking off as much as possible. And, you know, for example, like the gauge design on this is an example of that. Um, I mean, obviously Harley's legally required to put gauges on the bike, but they didn't want there to be a big gauge visually on the bike. They wanted it to kind of blend in seamless with the rest of the design. And so that's why you'll see on the, uh, the Street Bob that the gauge is actually embedded in the riser. And uh, it's this small LCD display, although it packs a whole bunch of information in there. So you've got, of course, your speedometer, your tachometer. It even has your gear position in there. Uh, it's got a fuel gauge, uh, range to zero. And there's a whole bunch of different options too that you can select and customize on there. And uh, it was something that people were worried about initially because they're like, well, how do I swap to a different riser? Um, but the aftermarket sorted that out pretty quickly. There's a lot of different options where the risers, you know, uh, allow for the mounting of the LCD into them, just like the factory one does. Or there's uh, also additional kind of uh, gauge housings. Uh, but you can even swap over to a more traditional gauge if you'd like. You know, really with Harley's kind of the sky's the limit. Once the aftermarket's had access to the bike for a year or two, you kind of know that there's going to be something out there. And if there isn't, there's somebody who's willing to fabricate something for you. So um, I think it's a really cool design. I think it goes really well with the Street Bob aesthetic. You know, I mean, obviously you're trying to strip off as much as possible when it comes to a Street Bob. So like I said, you know, we see in the comment section, how come Harley doesn't add this or this to the Street Bob? And it's like, the whole point of the bike is to be taking away as much as possible and doing the bare kind of uh, bob aesthetic. Uh, you don't want gauges on there, right? And the only reason that there is an LCD gauge is because it's legally required. Um, and so I think Harley did it in kind of the smartest way possible where, you know, when you're taking photographs of the bike or video of the bike, unless that LCD is directly in view, it looks like the bike came from the factory with no gauges, which is really cool. Um, and you know, when it comes to the custom bike, you know, scene, you know, that's what the bobber aesthetic is about. I mean, heck, those guys are taking off fenders. They're doing everything else, too. So, um, you know, that's part of the reason, too, when people are like, how come the Street Bob doesn't have dual discs? It's like, well, I mean, first of all, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about what dual discs actually do. I think a lot of people think that bikes with dual discs can stop faster than bikes without dual discs, which, I mean, I guess in certain circumstances where you have inadequate clamping force to lock the front tire might technically be true. So, you know, if for whatever reason your single disc setup doesn't have enough clamping force to lock the front, I guess adding a second disc to achieve that extra clamping force could technically make you stop faster, but really what's going to make you stop faster is a stickier tire. Um, because if you can lock the, the front tire, you can stop as fast as you possibly can, not by locking it, but by, you know, engaging ABS or if you don't have ABS, then manually uh, applying brakes until you hit the point at which the front tire is going to lock and then you relieve, you know, the, the front le lever and then apply again, um, you know, constantly kind of skirting the edge of the, the zone of friction of the tire. Um, really what dual discs are about are heat dissipation. The reason why racing bikes have them is because you come into the, you know, uh, a hairpin turn at 180 miles an hour and on the sixth lap that you do that, you know, your brake rotors are glowing red hot. Um, and they just, you need that extra surface area to dissipate the heat. It's not about braking force. Um, you know, I've, I, I, I don't like to admit it, but I've locked the front tire on a soft tail with a single disc rotor. Um, so it's, they're more than capable of locking the tire. Now, if you're tracking your Harley, uh, are you going to want a dual disc setup? Of course. If you're building a performance focused Harley and you want the look and the aesthetic of a dual disc setup, of course. If you're building a bobber, then you don't want the dual disc look. I mean, there's guys with bobbers that take the front brake off and they just run a rear bobber, you know, like the chopper style. So the idea of Harley, you know, having to or shouldn't, you know, that they were supposed to have put a dual disc on this, in my mind, just is based upon a couple of misunderstandings. One, of what a bobber is, and two, 
how uh, you know dual discs increase you know braking potential. They don't increase your braking force on your first lap. They increase your braking force on your sixth lap when you know you're cooking your your uh, your master cylinders fluid. You know, so. Um, yeah, I don't think that this bike needs a dual disc setup. I think if you're looking for that kind of performance muscle cruiser look, you're going to be better suited on other bikes in Harley's lineup. Not to say that you can't do kind of a club style build on this. We've done plenty of them and it looks awesome. Um, but, you know, you just kind of have to accept that you're either going to be swapping to mags because you're starting out with a bobber um, or uh, that you're cool with the spoke and single disc look. I, I'm a big fan of spokes um, and I'm a big fan of the single disc kind of showing off the wheel more. So, you know, I, I don't really have a problem with it, but if I was gonna build something like a Lowrider S, then of course I, I'm interested in, in the more performance looking uh, components. Like I want the inverted front end, I want the dual discs at that point, not because I'm gonna go any faster or stop any faster, but just because it looks the part. The Street Bob is probably one of those bikes too that I would definitely recommend to the guy that isn't gonna be laying down a whole lot of mileage. And sometimes it's not always clear and cut for people. They come in, they don't really know what type of riding they're gonna be doing. Maybe they're new to the Harley Davidson world. They don't realize that, hey, once you ride Harley Davidson's a lot, the more you ride, it seems like the longer distances people go. I would also ask like, if you have a group of friends that ride, maybe a group of friends are, are getting you into the whole Harley Davidson scene, ask them what kind of riding they plan on doing. If you plan on doing overnighters especially, but you know you want to stay within the soft tail world. The Street Bob may not be the best bike for you. You know, once you start laying down a lot of miles, those larger gas fuel tanks, so the five gallon fuel tank, become much more valuable to you. Uh, that and bags become a lot more valuable to you as well. Now, I know there's a lot of guys that we have that come in here that want to do longer rides, want to ride with a passenger, want to do overnighters, but they definitely don't want a touring bike for whatever reason that may be. Maybe they don't like the style of the full-blown bagger. There's still a lot of guys that want the mid-size frame. They want the clean, minimalist uh, profile of the soft tail. And they want to be able to ride harder and have a lighter bike. Maybe they're not the biggest guy in the world. Maybe they're a smaller framed guy. They definitely don't want the touring bikes. They definitely want to stick to the soft tail, but they want to do more of the touring oriented type of riding. Then you might want to consider like a sport glide or a heritage or something that is a little bit better suited out on the road with the, with the larger gas tank like a low rider S is. But if you're someone that does mostly local stuff, the three and a half gallon tank isn't really a big deal because you're not doing hundreds of miles uh, at a time. And you're still going to get a, probably 120 to 130 miles to the tank on the street bob. So take that into consideration uh, for sure. Obviously styling is a big thing with any Harley Davidson you buy. Uh, you've got kind of the old school gator guards on the forks and you've got that mini ape hanger bar as well. So definitely you've got that, that bobbered out style to it. Uh, a lot of guys throw fairings on the street bob. These bikes look great with a quarter fairing on there and kind of give it that club style look. I know a lot of guys feel like they got to get the low rider to do the club style look, but the street bob actually looks really good with that style. So that's always an option for you. You also have a little bit smaller headlamp on here. It is, it is LED, but you've got the five and three quarters headlamp. So again, on those long trips, you get those remote roads at night. You're riding into the night to your hotel or whatever. You're not gonna have as much light on the road as say something with the seven inch headlamp, like a, like a Sport Glide or a Heritage. You know, a Heritage, you've also got the, the two auxiliary lights as well. So lighting is something that I think people don't always take into consideration, but if you're someone that gets out there on the road and goes to remote places where there's not necessarily a lot of street lights, definitely something to take into consideration. I really don't see very many people adding lights to the street bob as well, because that kills the styling a little bit. So if you're a guy that's out there at night, riding into the night, lighting then becomes an issue for you. So yeah, again, if you're a guy that zips around town, inner city guy, uh, you want that club style look, you don't really care about the gas tank, you like that real good blippable power, the 114's there for you, looks good, has the bobber styling, plenty of power this year, a very enticing price point. You can't, you can't lose with the street bob at that point if that's your priority. But as you get into the longer mileage, you get into the touring stuff, you get out of town, you get out on the open road, that's when you're really gonna feel the smaller fuel tank. You're gonna start to feel 
the, the lighting that isn't quite going to illuminate the road and you know you don't necessarily have the wind protection although you can add that but things to consider the narrower wheels like the skinnier front wheel I don't feel like is as good out on the highway either because it has a tendency to kind of track the imperfections in the road and you just don't have like that as solid and planted feel as you do with a little bit wider front tire like on a slim or on a sport glide so something to take into consideration as well but if you want that bobber just throw around town that's real agile and the street bob is a good bet for you uh, one big thing I think that uh, is kind of hard to fix after the fact that if it's really important to you that you're going to want to consider ahead of time is that uh, both the Fat Bob and the Lowrider S have a 28 degree front rake, whereas the uh, Street Bob here has a 30 degree. And what that means is that out on the highway, this is going to feel a little less twitchy. It's going to feel a little bit more stable. But on a canyon road, you're going to have to put a little bit more input into the bars, a little more uh, you know, muscle to get the bike to lean over. Uh, it's not going to feel like it wants to transition as side to side as quickly or as nimbly as those bikes do. Um, I'd say it's kind of on par with where the Fat Bob is. The Fat bar, Bob has that big, wide, chunky tire in the front, which uh, looks really, really cool. And it's really well matched with the rear tire, but it does mean that it kind of limits how quickly that bike wants to transition side to side. It's not really noticeable until you ride it back to back with the Lowrider S and you've got that uh, 120 millimeter on the front with the 28 degree rake, then you really feel how nimble and capable uh, the soft tail chassis can be. Um, but this bike has a 30 degree front end and there's no, you know, I mean, increasing the rear suspension height is gonna increase the front rake, which will make the bike feel a little bit more nimble, but the same is true on the lowrider. So the reality is, if, you know, all things being equal, the lowrider S is gonna have a little bit lighter front end feel than the Street Bob is going to have, but this is gonna have a little more highway stability than the Lowrider S is gonna have. So um, it's a trade-off in either direction, but it's something that's impossible to change after the fact. So if you're the kind of guy where like a 28 degree front end is something that you even know about um, and you know why that's important and you care about that, um, obviously you're gonna to wanna to go in that direction from the get-go because uh, changing frames is the hardest thing to do and no one does that so that's kind of a ridiculous thing to do so pick the bike with the correct frame ahead of time uh, don't try to change frames later um, and don't cut your frame you know just just sell your bike and get a new bike um, but that aside uh, this is gonna have the 30 degree front end which is just gonna be a little bit more uh, highway focused a little more cruising focused whereas the lowrider s is gonna have that suspension geometry that's gonna be a little bit more aggressive so um, just something to, to factor in when you're, you know, just debating between the two, you know, do you do more highway or more Canyon, that kind of stuff? Cause the bikes are kind of suited, uh, but you know, it's, it's a, it's a relatively small difference between the two. All right, guys, thanks for tuning in. If you liked what you saw and you're not already subscribed, please hit that subscribe button and that thumbs up. It does help out the channel a fair bit. And uh, we really do hope that you learned quite a few things. If you had if any unanswered questions, please throw them down in the comment section and either myself or Matt will try to get to them. Please do throw them down there and we will try to get to them when we can. And in addition, uh, you know, if you're in the Southern California area and you're looking for a Harley, please you know, reach out to us. We'd love a, a chance to earn your business. And uh, as always, we do absolutely no dealer markup. And so that means you've got really straightforward and transparent pricing. And, you know, we really do work, like I said, to make sure you have a good experience. So please do reach out. As I mentioned before, like and subscribe. It helps out a bunch. And uh, we'll see you in the next, uh, the next review. All right. Bye, guys.